Okay. I think we're I think we've got sound going now. All right, sorry for that delay. Um please confirm if you can't hear me, but I think you should be hearing me at this point. Okay, we've got the risk warning on the screen. I'm sure we've all read this first page at this point. <coughs> Okay, so basically, Fed week this week, we've got the Federal Reserve meeting, that's probably going to set the tone of markets so far this week. Looking, it was a bit of a tentative start um, just a couple of hours ago. We we're looking slightly higher on the on US markets, um, but US stocks are looking sort of decently amount higher today, and I think <clears throat> in large part just come follow through on the sentiment from, from Europe. We haven't got that much in the way of economic data today or really any prominent earnings except after the close, which is not going to obviously affect today's trading of earnings from Apple. So if you haven't checked it out already, and even if you're not necessarily going to trade Apple stock, um, then you still check out our Apple report. Because to, to me, Apple is such a success story and so many fund managers hold Apple shares, that if Apple does well, it's really helpful to the stock market at large. If Apple disappoints, then, you know, that, that literally will have a big bearing on um, on uh, on stock market. So there was, um, you know, one of the big news items last week was that the NASDAQ composite, so you'll notice in, in our platform we trade the um, US NDAC 100, which is sort of a proxy for the NASDAQ 100. Um, so not the same as the, the composite, but the composite made new new record highs last week uh, for the first time in 15 years. And a lot of that gain is because of Apple. If you actually break down how much each company within the NASDAQ has contributed towards that gain, Apple has contributed something like 20% out of the sort of 25 odd percent um, gain that the, the index has made um, in the last 12 months. So Apple's pretty significant, but uh, that's tomorrow. Um, what we also have on the cards for, I mean, I think there's there's a few things going on this week, but some of the things I've got my eyes on, my eyes out on the most, would be UK first quarter GDP tomorrow particularly in the light of what's been happening in, in cable recently. So if we bring the, the cable chart up, this is the, the weekly chart. Now you can see we've obviously been plummeting in a pound against the dollar. This test of this 21-week SMA works this time. We made new lows. Didn't really make any new lows past here. You know, weren't really able to close the week below. We've pushed up, and now as of last week, we've closed right at this peak here. But it's also on the 21-week SMA again. And so entirely possible that we just roll over from here down to the lows again, maybe even new lows. To me, just based on barely the new low being created there and the kind of break of what I deem this to be from being quite an important level that we were bumping up against, basically the 150 round number. Having moved through that, I think the momentum shifted slightly for the pound. Uh, but whether that get, continues in, in the short term, I think may largely rest on this uh, UK GDP figure. Because growth was looking a little dicey, um, a little slower in the first quarter, but it seems to have picked up since. So maybe if it's not as bad as expected, then uh, you know that could be quite good for the, the British pound. Um, the main driver for, for pound dollar is dollar news. So don't get me wrong. If there's whatever happens out, the Fed is going to be the main driver. But you know the reason the pound might outperform others, other currencies in dollar terms, uh, would be this GDP that we've got tomorrow. Um, and also big news for the UK tomorrow. We've got earnings from BP. British, British Petroleum. Uh, then Barclays reporting on Wednesday. It's got another big earnings report. Um, and uh, and then US GDP report on Wednesday at uh, the same uh, the same day as the uh, the Federal Reserve policy meeting. So I was just having a quick look at cable there. But let's also let's just go straight back to indices. Look at the uh, the UK 100, our proxy for the FTSE 100. Again, we're on the weekly chart again. To me, just notable that we've got a couple of Haramis on a weekly chart here. So Haramis are candlestick patterns, similar to an inside day, 
but it's it's more about the the body of the candle than the um, than the high and the low. So here you can see that basically the body of this week was inside this week, which is not hard to do when given the size of that week. Um, and then the the you know the highs and the lows. I mean this is definitely an inside week, uh, inside week, but it's also another harami. So you've got kind of two weeks of harami going on here, which basically symbolises a sort of consolidation, a trading range, which typically you go for you know the cycle of the market is trading range to break out to trend, uh, to range. To continuation of the trend or reversal of the trend, you know, range to trend, range to trend. That's, that's the kind of flow of the market. And so here, this is a range at the top of the market. Possible indication based off of this divergence here, which you can see, where the RSI has not really made a new high, but um, the index has, and we've got this rising kind of possibility of a wedge pattern here, to so suggest that there could eventually be a push out lower. But at the end of the day, the trend is, the trend is higher. So never particularly recommended to trade against the uh, direction of the trend. Just uh, important to note when things, there is a few signs put together that um, could indicate a reversal. Not necessarily for trading it, but at least for being a bit more cautious if you are going long. Um, and let's just drop down to the daily chart. And so, here you can see this this line again. This is the, where these inside weeks were. Here's, the, here's that RSI divergence on the daily chart again, and uh, and so probably right around in uh, the 7,000 is you know, the big round number. We managed to hold off it, bounce off it a good number of times, which in of itself is, is quite a bullish sign. Um, but you know, a drop through there to me probably marks a, a move down to this this rising trend line, which sits around sort of six nine hundred odd. And not too far away from our um, our 55-day SMA, which hasn't been working especially well as an area of support, but still worth. You know, SMAs uh, are not necessarily useful just for getting a specific bounce off, but just telling us where we are in the shape of the trend. So this is just these moves through the the 55-day moving average here basically just tell us that the trend is not a really fast accelerating trend, which we can also see from the from the wedge pattern. Um, so that being the case, you know, we've got to kind of trade expecting kind of corrections in line with a slower paced trend rather than just very minimal corrections. You know, if this ends up being the, so we've got this move up here, if this ends up being the end of the correction, we fire off, then that's an acceleration of the trend. We're moving way above these moving averages, and then we've got to kind of pace ourselves according to shallower, shallower corrections if that trend is to continue. Mm -hmm. So um, let's just uh, have a look at Germany while we're staying in Europe. Now, a bit of a tricky one there. Now, this was a fast accelerating trend through to March. Got a new high in April, but not really much of a follow through on it, and we've traded right down to the lows. Now, in the latest price action, to me, this is kind of a, a bullish sign. We had a strong move down that week. But we never actually moved below the lows, and we managed to kind of break above this inside week. Not much follow through on the upside, but we've since we've managed to hold on to the 11,700 for a few weeks running, not managed to close above it. And now we've potentially got this move above this declining trend line. Now, I put it dashed because it only touches a couple of highs. It's not particularly meaningful, but does give us some indication of the, uh, the change in trend. Um, the the big one for for Europe this week, so for trading the uh, the Germany 30, but also I'll jump across, jumping around a little bit here, but just jumping over to the euro. A big one is going to be the eurozone CPI. Um, not game changing because we're still very much in the um, the mode of quantitative easing from the ECB, and the last. Policy meeting from the ECB tells us that uh, that trend, uh, you know, QE should be should be pretty ongoing um, until the end of the program, which is meant to be 2006, uh, September 2016. So that being the case, there are some signs here that uh, the euro could be beginning to base out because. My takeaway from that meeting is that yes, QE is most likely to continue, but it wasn't completely off the table that it could stop, and so there's been slightly better economic data from Europe recently. Um, 
obviously the main driver of ECB policy is um, inflation, and so that's what we're dealing with this week on, on Thursday at 10 a.m. British Standard Time. So it'll be a big one to watch, but still we are. QE is probably going to maintain, and it's not going to stop or start or accelerate based on one economic data point. But, you know, if inflation does start to pair back and we're no longer, you know, oil prices are starting to recover a little bit now, economic activity has picked up a bit. If we edge slightly further away from deflation, the reason for this quantitative easing program, which is pretty controversial, uh, certainly those in Germany um, and the Bundesbank don't like it, um, then, you know, it's like we're going to start having questions as to whether this program is really needed. Now, we've already been questioning it, but not really to some massive extent. That's not really, you know, obviously we've got to always keep it in mind, but if we start edging towards just no inflation or even small inflation, then definitely it's going to be, um, uh, it's going to be interesting um, in terms of the result for QE policy. So a couple of things to consider here. So this was the first thing on the chart. We never moved. We didn't make a new low. We weren't even able to test the low. And so since then, we've got this declining trend line, which does have three touches on it, and we've broken through it as of Thursday. And we've held above it on Friday. Now, we've got a bit of potential resistance coming in uh, from the 55-day, and I believe something uh, – I don't know. We're, uh, right, okay. This, um, this zone up here is where we can run into the 21-week SMA. So I have plenty of room for a bit of a recovery here. And so I think if we were to break above um, the sort of 110.50 type area that we've struggled with so far, we could be running into where prices broke down here in the week of the 22nd of February. And that does correspond roughly with that 55.50 SMA. But before we get there, we do have to break this pretty strong resistance. But to me, three tests. A fourth test possibly could fail. Fifth test will, um, will often break. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I wouldn't say CPI is going to get us through there, but um, CPI uh, in combination with uh, the result from the Fed meeting very well could do see us pushing through 111 this week. Mm -hmm. Now, jumping around again, as I mentioned, let's just jump back to indices. Now, let's refer to the U.S. since we have talked about the um, Federal Reserve meeting a couple of times. I was just looking at the uh, U.S. SPX today. Um, just because we're pretty much in our charts pushing into new all-time highs. Um, the, the, the official cash indices have not seen all-time highs just yet, but um, the, they are pretty close, and we could well see it today. So obviously that's all-time high is generally pretty indicative of an uptrend, but it's been pretty choppy getting there. Um, as I'm reading this 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 price action, um, we tried to push through uh, the sort of 2040 type level here, 2050 being the bigger round number. Failed sort of three odd times more if you count some of these higher wicks. Pushed through on this big up day here. Closed above all these moving average, trended up until we hit this declining trend line, saw a rapid fall off there, but held the moving averages and basically bounced right out of this, you know, this was the big, this was the big important day on April 6th, held that uh, breakout area and have just pushed on up to new highs since then. So the only risk really at this point is that um, we see a push up maybe to 2130 or to even just... Um, you know, even to just where we are, and see a sort of long wick and then close below. That um, is a risk to the uptrend, but a potential trading opportunity when you see a, a failed new high and a trade back into the zone. You know, we could be looking at um, prices falling down significantly from there. But to me, this sort of general action suggests that we're on the way to getting out of the, um, uh, out of the, the sideways zone to the upside. Again, largely depends on what the Fed have to say. But, and then following on from the RSI, I mean, really, these, these, the RSI doesn't work, all the, doesn't work perfectly all the time. Um, to me, we had a break here. We had a retest here. Now, it did follow through pretty well down to the lows here. But you've got to realize when a kind of stronger trend is starting to take shape 
And when we came down to the, you know, this low here, and then we weren't able to get through the low on the RSI equally with the price, you've got to realize, well, actually, this doesn't seem like it's following through this, this break of this rising trend. We're not even getting a lower low on the price. And then you keep aware of these peaks, and then you see we break that, and you retest here. So suddenly this, this rising line has been outdone by this uh, declining line here, as well as the other factors I talked about. <clears throat> Um, past the, so I mentioned this, we've got the US GDP report. That's, um, I mean, that could be quite significant because it sort of feeds into the, the Fed meeting. The, you know, the Fed, they're going to reach their decision at 7 p.m. Now, they're only getting the GDP information, um, you know, uh, a few hours before, but it is going to be a consideration to them. They're going to be aware anyway that the first quarter looks like it's slowed down a fair amount in the U.S., um, general assessment being about 1% GDP, whereas before, um, you know, it was more closer to 2.6%. So definitely a bit of a slowdown, and, you know, that's going to be a consideration for the Fed, alongside sort of weaker inflation and wage growth as to whether they actually still um, suggest that, as early as June, we could see a, a rate hike. I remember basically at any meeting, um, well, starting two weeks after they removed the patient's language, it shouldn't be this meeting uh, or the next one, but starting in June, we could, uh, from then on, where the possibility of a rate hike is, is on. So the kind of volatility we've seen here with some fast drop-offs drop -offs and snapbacks, uh, that's probably going to only accelerate as we go into the summer months, which are typically a bit more choppy anyway, and, uh, and also just past June, where um, any month from then on, um, any meeting from then on could be a rate hike, um, because any little data point um, is going to sway investors one way or other, whether the Fed are actually going to make the move and, and tighten. There's a general acceptance that they will at some point, which that may in fact get challenged if the data stays weak. But for the moment, there's a general acceptance they will hike. Um, but each data point is is um, is shifting the consensus to when exactly they will. If we have a look at the uh, the US 30, Ooh, what did I do there? Did I just close that straight away? Similar looking pattern. I've got this this channel on here. I think it's vaguely instructive. It's not it's not the greatest, um, basically because it hasn't lasted that long. But you can see these these lows are kind of in parallel. These highs were kind of in parallel. And right now we're basically, as of today, opened above the channel. Um, and it, to me, I think there's probably a pretty good chance that we're going to see a push through to to 18200. Um, but I think there is still a risk that we see a bit of a fault. Same as same as the S and P, uh, the SPX, where that could be a false break above new highs. Here, I think we could see a false break above 18,200 in the Dow. Remember, of course, Apple is now in the Dow. Um, the US 30 is our proxy for the Dow Jones Industrial uh, Index, and it. That Apple is now a component of that, so really strong earnings from Apple, really strong price performance from Apple is going to is going to help the Dow and help the US 30. Um, so maybe depending on how well Apple do, we get a push above 18,200 if they do quite well, and then um, it's good, then we're going to start looking ahead to some of the other earnings reports and the effect of the US dollar on international earnings. And we've also got the likes of uh, Chevron reporting later in the week. So these big U.S. oil companies, their earnings are probably going to be pretty bad. Um, you know, maybe better than expected, but still bad. <coughs> so that may temper how well the the Dow can um, can push beyond up into 18,300 roughly, which is its its all-time high. We kind of covered indices. We covered the the euro and the pound in currencies. Um, at any point, if there's something you wanted me to look at, um, yeah, just let me know. Send a quick chat through or Q and A. Can't actually see the Q and A right now. I don't know if anyone's uh, no one's messaged me on it. Um, so let's follow through. Dollar yen. 
some, been some pretty useless data out of Japan recently, but still it's just not the main driver. I think they've still got QE going, and the dollar is still generally um, stronger because of the prospect of tightening, um, but because of the massive run-up that it had prior to hitting 122, it's just still in sideways mode and broken a couple of rising trend lines here which offer some sort of opportunities down to the sort of, you know, you say you have the low here, the, the trend line breaks, retests and touches the low, here there's a low, just retest again. But um, it depends on your trading style. If you regularly trade the dollar yen, then it's you know it's just tricky trading right now. Um, if you trade on a slightly longer time frame, and you can pick and choose which markets you want to trade, my opinion is probably just stay away from dollar yen at the moment because it's just uh, you know it's just it's pretty choppy. Somewhere I would look um, for more potential favorable price action is in the, some of the commodity currencies, given that um, oil seems to be basing out a little bit at the moment, which we'll get to in a minute. New Zealand dollar, I think, is interesting at the moment. So looking pretty choptastic on the, um, the daily chart, but if we jump out to the weekly chart, something along the lines of a double bottom here. Now, we've seen the breakout. It's an immediate move back below the neckline, which is certainly not a positive, store, uh, positive sign. Um, but, you know, it's not like we've engulfed the week or anything. Um, the pattern is still roughly on. And there's been quite a nice little short, if you know, so you've got that longer term potential of a um, breakout. But, when, you know, you're right up here. You know, you're right at sort of um, the highest since, you know, highest all year, basically. Um, do you want to be buying right at the top of the breakout? You can, depending on your risk tolerance. Um, or, you know, a ways to reduce your risk on these longer-term trades is to scale down to the shorter time frames and just look for retracements. And here's, here it's looking all right so far. Here's that big weekly push and break higher. A couple of kind of um, shooting star patterns suggesting there's going to be a, um, a pullback. And we roll back straight down to the 61.8% retracement, um, which uh, nicely sort of lines up with this this kind of um, breakout level here, and you know where we found support, and um, and also this this kind of peak here, which is where we broke out above there. So a few things to suggest that might have been supported. It has. And we've basically got um, you know kind of tweezer bottom here thereabouts. Mm -hmm off the, the FIB level and the sort of uh, significant price level. So a few things to suggest maybe this could be the level um, at a slightly lower risk than buying right at the top of the market to um, to help us push up past the uh, past last week's highs and um, potentially reaching an objective from this double bottom pattern of right up around here at um, 80.50. And that would match up with um, some of these peaks back in October. And also this rising trend line that we had here on the um, the, uh, the weekly chart. Um, similar looking picture in the Aussie dollar, and that's often a good thing if you're trading these, um, uh, basically the Aussie and the Kiwi dollar. If they're moving to in sync, it's just a bit of extra confirmation of what's going on. So if I just quickly look at the Aussie. you can see that we've got this downslipping trend line. Now we had this one, which uh, we had a false break above, and but we found support at the, uh, the moving averages. And the um, this was the kind of uh, weekly supply zone as drawn according to this, uh, this breakout here, pushing above there. We've come back, kind of retested the, ch the top of that zone having failed to push low a couple of times, so not far off being a sort of um, almost a triple bottom here in the Aussie dollar. And then we've got this declining trend line, and as of Friday, we closed above it. And it's quite a long-term pattern, so um, that was a weekly close above it because it was a Friday. And now we're just sort of consolidating, retesting the line at the moment. That's the, lo the, the low is actually perfectly where the trend line is. So potentially right from here, we're off up to um, 79. Certainly could be a deeper correction down to this first trend line, or even the moving averages again. Below this low, 
the breakout above the, the, the declining trend line not looking so hot. But um, given the number of times that we tried to re-challenge this um, sort of 75, 50 type area, I think there's a good chance we can at least get to 79, and then obviously that needs to be broken to sort of really help this um, double bottom slash maybe even triple bottom type pattern to break out. We do run into some um, supply just above, which is something to bear in mind, which is where we saw that heavy breakdown on, the, on this week of um, January 18th. But that comes in around uh, just before 81, I believe. Yeah, 81 is the round number there. So given that we're below 79, we've just put in quite a sharp reversal on the week down here. Um, and we could be looking up to conservatively 80, 81-ish, possibly even the high. Um, yeah, some opportunities. Counter trend at the moment, but if we if the breakouts follow through, then it's you know you're, you're picking the trend reversal. Um, how are we doing for time? Oh, we're actually coming in right into the end of the, um, the event here. It was a couple of minutes late, so uh, let's flip over to, to gold. Um, gold is also one of those where, a bit like dollar yen, um, you know, if you trade it all the time, then you know, trade what you see. But um, if you don't, you know, if you trade a variety of markets, and you know, maybe you're trend following, um, just don't look at gold right now because it's it's you know, it's pretty choppy. As I had it read, there's a potential still just thereabouts. Um, Inverse head and shoulders after this this downtrend here, which kind of corresponded with the uh, the, the multi-year lows um, just above one one thirty. But after bouncing off this rising trend line here, we couldn't even get close to pushing through the highs for a towards the highs for a fourth time. You know, if you're counting that as one, two, uh, three, four, five, even, <clears throat> and we've actually dropped below this debatable rising trend line here and we found support just at this supply zone just having closed above that low. Um, so holding on thereabouts to a potential um, inverse head and shoulders but uh, the fact that we broke below what was quite a reliable support and then retested and moved lower again um, below 50 on the RSI more, more 47 thereabouts suggests we could get a bit more follow through to the downside. You know, the breakout in gold and its eventual move probably does, again, just depend more on the U.S. dollar side of the equation than it does gold. And the big driver of the dollar is going to be the Fed meeting this week. But um, in terms of the completion of this pattern, we need to hold above this little bit of neckline here, really, and um, and, and we need to break. Oh, sorry, not the neckline, but the bottom of the the right shoulder, and then we need to break the, the top of the neckline here. Obviously, you can get in early if you think it's, um, you know, wise to do so. Um, quick touch on silver. Here, we're right down at the bottom here. Just on a very sort of, uh, this is the daily chart. Um, I tried to look at the, the, you know, the peaks and troughs of the trend. And, you know, we had a trough here. Um, could barely close below it here, but pushed up, did eventually break down it here, broke below this low, um, made a new low down here, weren't able to close below that low, and we've pushed up a bit, and we're seeing a bit of follow through today, and that sort of corresponds with this breakout um, over here. So we are kind of making steady lower lows, but haven't actually managed to, see here we close below this low on this day, but we haven't, um, for the low of this day, we've not had a close below it yet. And it does correspond with um, the breakout over here. So potential early signs of a um, reversal of this move down inside this um, demand area here, um, off the lows. Again, a dollar story, really. Mm -hmm. um, best will last, in a way, because we've got the oil markets, which have been threatening a... Um, a move higher, but we've just been stumbling a bit in um, in WTI at 57. 
failed at it a few times. We're probably going to have another attempt at it. But we have broken down below this sort of fairly steep RSI rising trend line, so perhaps a move lower first before we um, really push higher in, in, um, in crude oil. We're just going to have to watch those um, inventories report starting tomorrow. The American Petroleum Institute, um, Wednesday's report, and then the rig count on Friday. You know, that's really what we're going on. That's the main driver here of, of all markets, rather than, I would say, um, any threats to supplies from uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia or Yemen or increased supply from Iran. I think they're sort of sideline topics. Okay. Um, quickly touch on Brent, but I think um, you can see that it's a kind of similar similar picture. Uh, I've drawn in this rising trend line, which is, does have three tests here, so it's vaguely valid. Uh, obviously, nothing really confirming the, the top side of it, but somehow maybe somewhere to sort of judge where this potentially could go up into this um, supply area up here. It does correspond roughly with a 70 mark. So, you know, if momentum... Uh, that we saw on, on Thursday continues, you know, 70 looks like it could be a possibility based on this sort of general um, rate of increase in, in prices. Just the fact that we are able to open above and hold above the, um, the previous peak last week I think is pretty key. You know, we tried to push below, couldn't, closed above it, closed higher. You know, that's, that's fairly bullish for the week. So uh, unless there's any sort of last minute questions, which I don't see at the moment, I think we're going to call it a wrap at that. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, good luck for trading this week. Jasper Lord signing out.